there you are. You're taking a test or quiz in AP Human Geography, and you're feeling good. You're cruising right along, bubbling in the correct answers until you get to one of those dreaded questions. There it is, a chart or a graph. And you think to yourself, oh no, here we go again. This question is probably gonna be harder. It's probably gonna take me longer. I'm never gonna get this right. And that's when you feel your confidence failing. Well, today, my hope is that after we do some review together, you will feel totally differently about questions that ask you to analyze data. I'm Miss Neuroth, and I am here along with the fabulous Mrs. Brandt as we go through eight days of review with you. So let's go ahead and get started. What are you going to learn today? Well, let's start with what is the purpose of our gathering together? This week, Mrs. Brandt started with some of the big overarching concepts in AP Human Geography. And then we started our uh, look at all of the different skills that you'll need to have in order to be successful on the AP test. So we are now at skill number three. Before we dive in too much to skill number three, though, let's talk a little bit about the overall goal of this whole video series. We are talking about how all of the pieces fit together in AP Human Geography. As I mentioned before, you might feel like you have a million little facts running around in your mind right now. You've got all of these pieces. Our job now is to put them together. AP Human Geography is like a giant jigsaw puzzle of knowledge about the world around us. And this last part of the year is really making sure that you can tie those things together and articulate what you know about the world on the AP exam. So what is the structure of our video series? As I mentioned a moment ago, we started out with the big overarching concepts. And now for five days, we started on uh, Tuesday, we're going over the important skills that you need to master to be successful on the AP test. Next week on Monday, we'll continue with skill number four. And then on Tuesday, we'll talk about scale analysis, one of those really tricky concepts for the AP test. After that, on Wednesday, we'll be talking about all of the common misconceptions and misunderstandings that students have. And then the final day, we'll wrap it all up by talking about specific strategies for multiple choice and FRQ questions. We also want to remind you that while we wish we could answer every single question that we get in our feedback form, which you see with the QR code here, we aren't able to go into detail about explaining every vocabulary term, for instance. And in our precious amount of time that we have here together, we only have about 40 minutes. We don't have time to go into every concept from the entire course. Think about it. It took your teacher an entire school year to teach you those things. The beautiful thing is that if you go to AP Classroom and you log in there, you can watch content videos about any of these topics. So like we said yesterday and the day before, if we get to a concept today that you realize that you're a little fuzzy on. You can always pause the video and go to AP Classroom, watch the content for that particular subject, and then come right back and join back in. I also remind you, if you're joining us live, you can pause. Um, if I am talking too quickly for you, you can pause that or slow it down. And again, if you're watching this recorded later, then you can always pause or speed up if, um, if things are going too quickly or too slowly for you. So let's get started today. What is our actual topic for today? Well, we are talking about data analysis. And yes, I've got my little brain back there because these are the heavy lifting skills. This is where your brain really has to work to put all of the pieces together of what you've learned throughout the year. You may have noticed that Mrs. Brandt and I have been really highlighting those key task verbs identify, describe, explain, and compare. Those verbs are gonna become even more important as we talk about 
how to tackle the FRQ questions in particular. So we're really going to be working to unpack what does it mean if a question asks you to identify something? Or what does it mean when it asks you to describe? So that hopefully on the AP test, you feel really well equipped to provide the best answer that you can give. So let's look at what we've got here today. First, we're going to be working on identifying different types of data presented in maps and in quantitative and geospatial data. I'll show you examples of that in just a moment if that feels like you're not quite sure what that means. Next, we'll be describing spatial patterns. And you might remember in the last couple of videos, we've talked about what that word spatial means. We've talked about how historians look at when something happened and geographers look at where. So when you see that word spatial, in your mind, you should automatically think that word where. So describe spatial patterns presented in maps and in quantitative and geospatial data. Then we're going to explain patterns and trends. So we'll look at how is it different to describe a pattern and how is it different to explain a pattern? Uh, some of you wrote in our feedback form yesterday that you were curious about that and you wanted to know what is the actual difference between describe and explain. We'll dive into that a bit more today. Um, we are going to compare patterns. So looking at two different things, two different patterns and trends in a map or in quantitative or geospatial data. And we're gonna use what we're comparing to draw some conclusions. We are gonna explain what maps or data imply or illustrate about geographic principles, processes, or outcomes. And then we're gonna explain possible limitations of the data provided. Again, remember, like we've said before, any of the content is fair game to be tested on. It may or may not end up on the test, but we know for sure that these skills will be assessed. So you know that they're going to, in some way, try to figure out if you can do these skills through the types of questions that they ask. Now, I did want to jump to something real quick because I forgot to mention this earlier. Uh, I want to address a couple of questions that came up on the feedback form yesterday before we get going too far here. Uh, some of you have said, can you please talk about what does it mean when they say the degree to which or explain the degree to which? I've come up with a couple of slides specifically on that that we will go over together next week on Tuesday when we talk about scale analysis. So have no fear, we are going to get into that so that you know exactly what that means. Also, uh, some of you asked about scale, that you're struggling with that or confused about that. We'll definitely spend some time on that. And in fact, our entire day uh, next week on Tuesday will be de devoted to the concept of scale. And then finally, I thought this was a great question. And I think that this is something that a lot of students get scared of. They ask, do I need to know every single country on the planet in order to do well on this test? Do I need to do a bunch of map quizzes and memorize countries? The answer to that is no, but I'll get into the but in just a moment when I talk about what kind of countries you would need to know and how that might come up in a test question. So let's dive in and I think I'll be able to illustrate that here in just a moment. So here we have our very first topic, identifying the different types of data presented in maps and in quantitative and geospatial data. So the question really is, what does this data show? So can you identify categories of data presented in maps? And then what patterns do you observe? So in this case, knowing the names of countries, at least larger countries that are brought up a lot in class, countries like China, India, Russia, um, South Africa, Australia, Brazil, the United States, Canada, these are just countries that are coming off the top of my head that I've noticed are asked about a lot in practice questions in AP Classroom. They come up as great examples in a lot of the textbooks and review books. Knowing where those countries are can be really helpful, especially when you're trying to connect information that you've got from class, what you've read, to what you're seeing here in a map. So for instance, this map is showing GDP per capita, gross domestic product. So we're looking at um, you know, the, the economic development of a lot of these countries. 
So if I know the names of the countries, then I can maybe attach that to something that I know about that particular country. For instance, as I'm looking in Northern Europe, I see that Norway has a really dark color, meaning that it has higher levels of GDP, higher levels of um, income in the country. They're, they're just more economically advanced. Now, when I notice that, because I know that that's Norway, I might be able to attach that information to something else that I've learned before. So for you, for instance, perhaps your teacher talked about how Norway has very low birth rates or um, Norway has um, really good programs for, for taking care of um, people's health, for instance. So if you, if you know those things about Norway and you can identify it on a map, that's going to be super helpful when you're looking at overall patterns and having to explain or compare those patterns that you see. The, the more you can actually attach what you know to what's physically on the map, the better you're going to be equipped to do well on the test. So I wouldn't say spend hours and hours of your time. If you haven't studied this at all, all year, I wouldn't say spend all of your time prepping on that. But I do think it would be good to familiarize yourself with countries. Not only that, but, you know, if you if you've finish an AP geography class, you should probably know where the countries are around the world, right? That just makes sense. So it will help you be able to attach your knowledge to that physical place. Um, again, helping you make those, um, helping you draw concluded conclusions about spatial patterns. So that would be my long-winded answer to that question. Uh, and hopefully that helps. So let's come back to our map here. What patterns do you observe? So as we're looking regionally around the world, uh, we notice that North America, for instance, tends to have a lot darker color, meaning higher GDP. We see the same thing reflected in Europe for the most part. And then, of course, Australia and New Zealand. And then we can kind of look at the opposite end of the spectrum where we see low levels of GDP in um, parts of Central Asia, certainly in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, we're seeing those lower levels of GDP. So in this first, um, this first skill, we're just looking at identifying. We're just saying, can I use my eyes? Can I use what I know to make some observations and identify some of that data or identify some of those patterns? Let's take a look at what this might actually look like on an AP test question. So here we have a map, and I, I wanted to show this to you large first before I actually go to the question. And I put this little thought bubble on the side. Can you identify the data presented in this map? So before I even get to the question, I'm going to observe the map. Well, right there at the top, I see that the map is about infant mortality rate. And I see that the map has a legend or a scale down at the bottom there with varying colors that illustrate higher or lower levels of infant mortality. So I'm taking a moment just to observe the map itself and identify what kind of data I'm looking at. So here's the question. It says, infant mortality rates, infant mortality varies widely around the world and is affected by complex real world characteristics. Let's pause there for just a sec. Some of you have been asking for more vocabulary. So let's review what infant mortality is or infant mortality rates. That would be looking at how many babies die, babies that are born alive, die before reaching their first birthday. Child mortality would be looking at how many children die before their fifth birthday. So just a little vocab review there for you. The infant mortality rate is a key demographic indicator that can be used to assess social, economic, and other conditions at multiple geographic scales. Two additional notes to make right now. This is the first part of an FRQ question. Sometimes students kind of skip over that initial bit of information and they just want to jump right to answering the question. I highly caution you against that because that information that they give you there at the beginning is not to slow you down. It's actually to help you. It's to provide you with some context. So really take a moment to read that carefully because there could be key information there that can guide you as you go on to answer the question. I also wanted to make the second note that 
students often ask me, what does it mean when it says demographic? They're, they forget that word and they forget what that means. Whenever you see that word demographic, I want you to think population. So demography is the study of population. A demographer is someone who studies population. So a key demographic indicator would be a key indicator related to population. So let's get to the actual question now. Identify the predominant ranges of the infant mortality rate found in South Asia and Western Europe. So let's take this methodically. Let's look at South Asia. So I see that the predominant or the overarching color is this shade right here. So the predominant range of infant mortality rate in South Asia is 30 to 59. Then I need to look at Western Europe. So when I look at Western Europe, I see that the predominant range is down there at two to 14. So if I'm answering an FRQ, first thing is I'm gonna make sure that I phrase this in a complete sentence, no bullet points on those FRQs. So I would simply say the predominant range of infant mortality rate in South Asia is 30 to 59. And the dominant range of infant mortality in Western Europe is from two to 14, period. That right there is perfect. That's exactly what they would expect to see. If they're asking for an identify, you don't need to write a huge long paragraph for that. One complete sentence that accurately answers that question is enough and you can move on. All right, let's go on to our next topic here. Describe spatial patterns presented in maps and in quantitative and geospatial data. So a key question to ask ourselves here is, what patterns can you identify from the data? So I put together a, a made up chart. I just made this up for the sake of us getting to talk about it today. So I have hypothetical countries there, W, X, Y, and Z. And the question over here in the green says, can you describe patterns and data such as land use patterns and practices in different agricultural regions. So when I'm presented with a chart like this, and at the beginning you, you noticed that I said, you know, you're going through a, a quiz or a test and you're doing well, and then you hit one of these kinds of questions. You get to a question that has a chart like this. And you might freeze up because you're thinking, oh my goodness, there are so many numbers there. My brain is starting to melt. I don't know what to do with this information. Well, I say, pause, take a deep breath. Some questions are going to take you longer and that's just fine. Take a moment to look at what the chart is actually showing. So I've got country, I've got their total land area. I have how much land was used in 1950 for agriculture. And then I've got agricultural land use percentage in 2020. So I, when I start with that first column, I noticed that the total land area goes all of the way from country W, our largest country by land area, all of the way down to a country that's much smaller, country Z, um, that is just a fraction of the size of country W. But then I, I noticed some interesting patterns here. So if I look at country W, it's a really big country, but oddly, they were using more land for agriculture in 1950 than they are today. Now, it doesn't tell me why that's happening, but it might make me start to generate some questions. Have they become more efficient? Are they using more machinery? Um, did they really embrace the green revolution? And are they using more um, you know, high yield seeds or something like that? Or has um, something sort of tragic happened? Have they lost farmland for some reason? Was it desertification, soil salinization? Was it that suburbanization has encroached on that farmland? I don't know that from this chart, but I can start making some guesses or I can start asking some of those kinds of questions. Now, country X, for instance, is also a pretty large country, but interestingly, their land use percentage has increased in from 1950 to 2020. I see the same is true of country Y, their land, their, uh, land use has increased and country Z has seemed to stay pretty close to about the same during that period of time. So 
if I see this word describe in an FRQ, I'm not going to be able to do that adequately with just one sentence. Now, I want to be clear here, and I'll go over this again in the future. The AP graders are not going to be counting your sentences necessarily. Okay, that's they're not counting just the volume of information that you can provide. But what I'm guiding you on is is telling you that it's very, very hard to have a good description in one sentence, nearly impossible to have a really great description in that amount of writing. So you want to elaborate on what you know. Describe what you're seeing in total land area. Describe how you see those trends changing from 1950 to 2020. And it's a great idea in your answer to pull out specific information from the chart. And I'll get into that in just a few minutes when I, when I show you another example. All right, here's another one. Again, what patterns can you identify? Here's a different kind of stimulus. So we had a chart before. Um, now we've got um, sort of a graph here. Um, so I see, first of all, in that blue color, that is the number of farms in millions. And it's really interesting to see that, um, again, as I'm looking, I should have started with just reading the title, right? Farms, land and farms and average acres per farm from 1850 to 2019. And then we're looking at a million farms, billion acres or 100 acres per farm. That feels a little overwhelming because there's a lot of information there. But at this point in the year, you've probably seen your fair share of charts and graphs. And so this shouldn't feel super new to you. So we see the number of farms. Very interestingly, um, in 1850, we see a sharp increase. This also happens to be when we have a lot of people moving to the United States. We have westward expansion during that time. Um, we have, uh, you know, more and more people moving here to farm. We see sort of this peak around the 1930s, 1940s, and then a pretty dramatic decrease. Now, some students would think, does that mean that we have dramatically less agriculture? And the answer to that is no. We have less actual farms, but notice what's happening with that green line. The average size of the farm is increasing. So I brought this up because this is a key concept from the agriculture unit, particularly as we look in the United States, where we see machinery um, being used more and more. We see less number of farms, but the farms themselves are getting much larger. So again, they, this is meant to just sort of get you thinking about what you're observing, getting you to connect this information to other things that you've learned from class. Let's take a look at one more here real quick and then we'll move on. Again, what patterns can you identify from the data? So we see um, US agricultural output inputs and total factor productivity. So how productive are our farms? Um, so we see that um, we have both inputs and outputs increasing over time, meaning the amount of things going into getting crops to grow and to getting that farm running. And then what's actually coming out of that farm is increasing, which is pretty interesting to think about. Um, but that, that total farm output has sort of remained sort of consistent. So inputs to outputs, the more we're putting in, the more we're getting out. Um, so again, we're just, I'm, notice what I'm doing. I'm literally just describing for you what I'm seeing here. And that's what we want on a description. I'm not having to explain why it looks this way. I'm describing the trends that I'm seeing. Let's keep moving along. Our next concept here, our next skill is explaining patterns and trends in maps and in quantitative. So remember, quantitative means something that can be counted, very simply stated. So data that has a number associated with it and geospatial data to draw conclusions. So this is where we're getting into explain. So how does the trend in the data inform your conclusion? And how does the trend in the data support your conclusion? So one way we could look at this is, can you identify multiple patterns or trends within a data set and describe how and why they are related? For instance, like population pyramids and economic development. I think this will all be much clearer when I show you the example I have for you. 
And by the way, this is a shout out to the student who requested, can you please talk about population pyramids and how they relate to the demographic transition model? We're going to put these two things together as, as requested. So again, before I show you the actual question, let's zoom in to look at the stimulus. And whenever I say stimulus, I mean whatever kind of image, graph, chart, map, anything that you have to look at in order to answer the question. So the little thought bubble here is, can you explain the patterns and trends in the pyramid? That's the skill we're looking for. So let's, let's observe these two pyramids here. Clearly, they're from two very different kinds of countries. Um, pyramid A or country A has a very wide base and a skinny top. Uh, so if I was to describe what I saw here, I would say that this country has, um, you know, a lot of youth, a lot of children um, based on that wide base. They also have a low life expectancy as evidenced by that skinny top of the pyramid. Country B has a much more stable population structure. Um, they have people living to a lot older age. They have a lot longer life expectancy. You simply see more people up there near the top of the pyramid. I also do see the hint of a declining population. As you see, the base of the pyramid is getting smaller, especially in those last um, four cohorts. Remember, a cohort is an age group. Those little bars on the pyramid are cohorts. We see those shrinking as they get down there towards the base. So that would be me describing what I see. Now I need to explain. So the key thing here that I want you to think of is the word why. If you're going to explain something, if it ever says explain, I want you to think that explain has two best friends, why and because. If you say an explain, Somewhere in your response, you should have the words why and because. You should be answering that why and then sharing evidence or providing evidence with that because. Here's the whole question, and we'll go ahead and practice that. It says, the population pyramids represent two countries at different stages of the demographic transition and economic development. A, explain the demographic characteristics of each country with respect to the demographic transition model. Then describe one positive impact of each country's population structure on its economic development, and describe one negative impact of each country's population structure on its economic development. Let's break this down and take it one at a time. So let's start with part A. Explain the demographic characteristics of each country with respect to the demographic transition model. So again, here we have this word explain. So for the first one, country A, I would need to explain that this country has a wide base, kind of like I was talking about before. This country is a stage two country. It is stage two in the demographic transition. So we can do a little review here together. So if you're alone, you can do this. You don't have to worry about anybody watching you, or you can just like do this in your mind. I actually make my students do this in class. Let's pause and think about what does each pyramid look like as it relates to the demographic transition model. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, A, I don't really know pyramids very well, or B, I don't really remember the demographic transition model very well, this would be a fabulous time to pause to go and watch the videos from 2.5 and 2.3, which go into great detail about both of those concepts. So if you need to do that before you come back, I think that's a great idea. All right, so back to our, our little illustration. Okay, if you're doing this along with me, I want you to put your hands up, okay? If I am a stage one country, which we know there's no country in the world that is still in stage one, my pyramid is gonna be pretty, pretty dramatic, okay? In fact, it's going to have a wide base and very, very few people up here towards the top. As I move into stage two, this is when I look like a traditional pyramid. I'm so proud of those of you who are actually doing this. I can't see you, but I'm just imagining you're following along with me. I love it. All right, so here's our stage two. It looks like a traditional pyramid. As we get into stage three, the base gets smaller because their birth rate starting to go down and the top gets just a little bit wider people are living longer. So 
a little bit smaller base, a little bit more people at the top. A stage four country is going to look more like a stable column, kind of all, all the different age groups for the most part are pretty, pretty similar, okay? And then as we get into stage five, we start to see the base of the pyramid come in and the top get a lot wider. This is where we have that old age dependency or the elder dependence. And we have very few people down here at the bottom because of that dropping birth rate. So you can just think about it as stage one, two, three, four, and five. If that helps you kind of getting your body moving and thinking about it that way, then that might help you remember how to attach these pyramids to their stages in the DTM. All right, so back to explaining the demographic characteristics. For this first pyramid, I would say pyramid A or country A is in stage two of the demographic transition. So that's, I'm identifying the stage. Then I would say, because, see that word because? I would just, then at that point in time, I would explain the wide base. This is showing the very high birth rate. Um, the falling death rate is happening at that point in time in stage two. Um, we still see, you know, not a very long life expectancy, but we see that explosive population growth illustrated in this pyramid. Okay. That's why this pyramid or this country would be in stage two. So moving on to the second pyramid, I would say this country is in stage four of the demographic transition. And I would explain that why is it in stage four? It is in stage four because of that fairly even stable pyramid. I would say that I would predict that this country may even be soon moving into stage five because of what I, I had uh, mentioned before about that base starting to get skinnier down there at the bottom, um, indicating a declining birth rate. I would talk about the longer life expectancy and so on. So that would be explaining the demographic characteristics. Again, remember, demographic means population. So the population characteristics of each country and I made sure to attach that to the appropriate stage of the demographic transition model. Let's move on to the next piece of the question, which was, describe one positive impact of each country's population structure on its economic development. I wanted to take a moment to focus on this because a student asked in, in the um, feedback, if it asks you to give one, should you actually give more to show that you really know what you're talking about? And my answer to that is no. We call that a laundry list. What I mean by that is it, it sounds like you're just kind of throwing everything you can at the answer. Um, this might work or this answer might work or this answer might work, but you don't actually know what you're talking about. So if they want one impact, pick one thing and make sure you describe that really, really well. So if you remember, we said, when it says describe, imagine describing your best friend. If we said describe one aspect of your best friend, and you decide that the aspect you're going to talk about is your best friend's personality. So if you're talking about your best friend's personality, you may talk about how they make you laugh so hard because they're so, they, they're so funny and they really, their sense of humor is great. They always remember all of the movie quotes, whatever. Well, you're not going to start going on and say, oh, and they also have brown hair. Okay. That does show me, you know, about your, your best friend, but it's not describing the one aspect that you've selected for that particular, um, that one particular thing that you've decided to describe about your best friend. So for this, if I'm going to describe one positive impact, just for the sake of time, let me give you some examples of some things I could say. So if I'm talking about country A, a positive impact might be that in the future, I may have a large workforce because those children are going to grow up, many of them, and, and be active, um, could potentially be active members of our society and, and contribute to the workforce. I don't really have to worry about a declining workforce. In the second pyramid in country B, I might emphasize things like they have a low youth dependency. I don't have to worry about a lot of children 
that are too young to work that have to be cared for with schooling and health care. That's not going to be a, a giant economic drain on my country. Notice that I just focused on those particular things. There are many other things I could say, but my description would really dig in deeper to the specifics of those particular things that I've chosen to share. All right, let's keep going on. Part C, oops, is the negative impact. So again, for country A, I might talk about um, the high youth dependence and the fact that that could be uh, a challenge for the government of that country um, to develop economically if they're pouring so many resources into schooling and healthcare for children. For the, for pyramid B or country B, I might focus on the possible future labor shortage because they don't have enough young people coming in to replace the jobs that their elders are currently doing. So again, there are lots of other answers, but that just gives you an example of what I could use um, as an answer for this particular piece of the question. All right, we're cruising right along. We are now to comparing patterns and trends and maps and in quantitative and geospatial data to draw conclusions. So now you see I put these two little puzzle pieces together because when I'm comparing, I'm looking at two different things. So what conclusions can you draw by comparing the trends you found in the data? So now this is where we really get to be those super smart geographers. We not only can describe the data that we see, but we can draw conclusions about it. And really, this is the most exciting thing about AP Human Geography. And I've hope, I hope you've had this experience throughout the year at least once, if not many times, where you've observed something in the real world that you can explain because you've taken this class. How exciting is that, right? You say, oh, I know why that happens. Um, I know why voting patterns look like that because I learned about that in AP Human Geography. So now the idea here is, being able to draw conclusions from that information. That's the real power of this class. So let's look at an example to illustrate what this would look like. So here I have, yes, another scary graph. Remember, we're trying to get, become less scared of these so that when you see them on the test, they're not intimidating to you. Can you compare the patterns and trends to draw conclusions? So here we have the graph over here to the right. It's the percentage of land used for agriculture for selected regions. So you see the key at the bottom. We're actually looking at regions, not by country, countries in this particular instance. It says the graph shows trends in the percent of each region's total land area used for agriculture. Now, there's a lot going on here. So before I get too far ahead, I do want to say one quick thing. Um, oh, sorry. I think I got ahead of myself. I'll come back to that. We're going to focus on the compare first, and then I'll get to my little, my little tidbit. So using the graph, compare the trend lines for the region of Europe and the region of the Middle East and North Africa for the 1981 to the 2001 time period. Wow. That seems like a mouthful, right? And you might have read that if you got this on the AP test and you'd think, oh my goodness, there's so many numbers in there. They're talking about different parts of the world. And you might start to feel that anxiety. Tell yourself, take a deep breath and take it one piece at a time, okay? So first we have Europe. All I have to do is find Europe on my little scale or on my little graph there. So I noticed that Europe is that dotted line. Hopefully you can all identify that now. Okay, so I'm just gonna take a look at Europe and, and right away I notice it's trending downward. Now I go to look at the Middle East and North Africa. I find that it's got that like uh, sort of more dashed line with a dot in it. And I notice that overall it's trending up. Now I can't jump ahead just yet because I remember that it said specifically from 1981 to 2001. So that's where I have to look at that specific slice of the graph. And if it helps you on the AP test, you can even cover up the pieces that you don't need. You can draw or write on it. You can put your hands up to the screen or whatever, depending on which version um, or which mode you're taking the test in. But do what you need to do to help focus you in on exactly what they're asking for. So in this case, Europe has actually trended down from 51%-ish in 1981 to about 44% in 2001. Notice how specific I'm being in my answer. 
I'm showing the grader that I can actually read this graph by using those specific numbers in my answer. Whereas during the same period of time in the Middle East, they've gone up from 21% in 1981 to 34% in 2001. So the, the question I would ask is, what conclusions can you draw? Maybe I look at Europe and I think um, maybe because they have a declining population in some of these countries, they're actually using less land for food because they need less land. Maybe it's because they've become more efficient. I don't know for sure, but I could draw some pretty educated guesses some pretty educated conclusions by looking at the data. All right. Let's keep moving along and I'll give you my little tip here in just a second. You see more puzzle pieces coming together as we talk about this. Explain what maps or data imply or illustrate about geographic principles, processes, and outcomes. So how do these data, how does this, all these numbers and trends and all of this stuff actually relate to a geographic process that we've talked about in class? Let's see what that would look like in a question. Here's a question about the Green Revolution. I, I guess today is all about agriculture. My, my students laugh at me because I really love this unit. So maybe that's why I subconsciously picked a lot of agriculture questions. But let our little thought bubble here, our guy is saying, can you explain what this data illustrates? So we're looking at wheat yields in pounds per acre for selected regions. Now, this is a question from AP Classroom. And here's what the question said. So again, you might have might be thinking, oh my goodness, so many numbers, so many dates, so many uh, you know, regions of the world, how am I gonna tackle this? Like I said before, one step at a time. A little side note for you, a little helpful hint as we pause here for a moment. I always recommend to my students that you take time to annotate the FRQ question. If you're, if you're doing the written exam, actually writing on the question itself, you might want to note the important command verbs like explain, describe, compare, any key vocabulary words or any other important word or phrase like are they wanting you to answer at a specific scale? Do you need to provide some kind of specific example? All of that will help focus your thinking. So even if you're doing it digitally, just take a moment to really pay close attention to important words or terms that are coming up in the question so that you make sure you actually answer what the question is asking. So in this case, I just went ahead and I illustrated for you what kind of things I would focus on. So again, I'm not going to forget about that initial bit of information at the beginning. It says the graph shows regional and global trends in wheat farming since 1961. Um, in this graph, the amount of wheat is measured in pounds per acre of farmland. So in part A, using the graph, compare. That's an important word. And then I see the specific regions of East Asia and Europe for these specific time periods. I don't want to accidentally mix them up with different time periods or different uh, regions. So I'm going to highlight those or underline those or focus on those to make sure that I'm actually answering the correct piece of the question. Part B, explain how one improvement in agricultural technology had an impact on global wheat productivity. So they're asking for a specific scale there. They're not asking about a, a country or even a region. They're talking about global productivity. Part C, explain why the Green Revolution had similar impacts on farming in South Asian countries compared to East Asian countries. So again, explain. What are the best friends of explain? Why and, beca and because. And then I'm looking at the Green Revolution in those particular areas. Finally, using one region on the graph, explain the relationships between changes in wheat farming and the education of women. <clears throat> Here's again where I'm drawing conclusions, putting together what I've learned from the year and applying that to the question at hand. I don't have time to go through all of this in detail with you, um, but hopefully this gives you an idea of how to sort of unpack a question where you're having to use data like this. All right, let's go to the last one here. What can the data tell you? This is always my favorite, explaining the limitations of the data. I always like to say, Here's how it's not helpful. Or yes, it's great for this, but it can't always tell us this or that. So the question I have here in green is, 
what is the limitation of using gross domestic product or GDP per capita as a measure of a country's level of development? So we see these different countries listed here, and GDP can tell us about the economic productivity of a country, but it's limited. Remember, GDP does not take into consideration the informal market. It also does not take into consideration under any gender imbalance or gender disparity with pay or participation in the workforce. So it can only tell us so much. It's useful, but it's limited. And if you can explain the limitations of data, like country W might be very highly developed, but is there a huge gap between rich and poor? Some, a few people that have most of the country's wealth and a lot of people down here, I can't tell that from the data. So that would be a limitation of the data provided. A limitation of looking at this map to help us understand voting patterns is that it's at a specific scale. It's telling us how different states voted as a whole. But I don't know if within the state of Arizona, for instance, was it a really close race or was it a landslide? I can't tell that because this data is provided at a specific scale. That would be a limitation. All right, I'm trying to not go over, so I'm gonna wrap up here. So what can you take away from today? Hopefully your brain is feeling a little tired by now because you've done a big workout. We have covered a lot today. And hopefully at this point, you feel a lot less scared when you see a chart or a graph or some kind of data presented on a question on the AP test. Thank you again so much for your feedback so far. We have really taken to heart what you've had to say. And in fact, I really enjoyed the questions that you gave for next week, um, specifically about strategies for multiple choice and FRQs. And I've included some of your questions in that presentation. So please tell us, how are we doing? Do you have something specific you want us to talk about um, for next week? Uh, or do you have some questions that are brought up by what we've gone over over the last couple of days? Thank you again. I hope you're feeling more confident today. I hope that you feel just a little bit better than you did about an hour ago, and that as we go through this series, you feel like you're ready to ace the AP exam. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and we'll see you next week.